All right, and we got people coming in. We got the message. So uh, for those of you joining us, uh, we had some uh, technical difficulties with the other platform. Uh, apparently the internet uh, broke. Uh, oh. And uh, the other platform is live as well. So we have to- In parallel, yeah. Yeah, let's uh, just make sure that everybody joins the other platform. Looks like they're doing that. All right, and people are joining, and this is nice. This is nice. <laughs> we're getting there, yeah, we're getting there. What's, that, what's that meme with the guy with the, the dog with the, the coffee cup and everything's no. burning? This, everything's this is okay. fine. Yeah. No, boy. Everything's fine. <laughs> so Jason, let, let's pretend we didn't, we didn't catch up earlier. Jason, how's it going, man? Long time. <laughs> Very well, good to see you guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, for, for those just joining us, uh, we're, we're on live with uh, Jason Miller of, uh, of LinkedIn and Microsoft fame. Um, very, very impressive guy. Uh, I don't know, uh, Jason, maybe, maybe you can introduce yourself, uh, tell everybody a little bit about your background, how you kind of ended up after, after everything ended up in uh, living in London and, and working for LinkedIn and, uh, and Microsoft. Yeah, of course. Um, so I started off, in the, uh, the music business, funny enough, and watched the uh, music business completely sort of uh, uh, crumble in on itself for fighting digital technology instead of embracing it. And I uh, got out and uh, had to sort of reinvent myself and get into uh, the world of B2B marketing, which I never thought I would be doing. But it uh, worked out. I was at Marketo for a couple of years, uh, and then LinkedIn called. I was at LinkedIn for almost uh, just over six years um, on the LinkedIn marketing solutions side. So. It was an interesting story. I never told you this, but uh, the week I started was the week we launched sponsored updates in the feed. So we had really uh -huh. no advertising options on the platform except for text ads and display. Wow. I remember. And, uh, you know, it's funny. When I left Marketo to go to LinkedIn, everybody at Marketo was like, what the hell is LinkedIn Marketing Solutions? Nobody knew, knew even nobody even knew what it was. It was like a, uh, a mishmash of like SlideShare and display and text, and it wasn't really even formed yet. It was like seven yeah. people on the team. And, you know, I was there for six years and <clears throat> three years or uh, three, three and a half years in San Francisco and then uh, moved over to London to build out the, uh, the content and social team over here. And uh, yeah, then I left and went to Microsoft for a year and a half and uh, just, uh, just left Microsoft about four weeks ago. So I'm a free agent right now, but I do have a couple things lined up I can't really talk about, but yeah. Congratulations, anyway. man. I think, you know, leaving Microsoft has to be probably one of the the best things you can say you've done, like it's an accomplishment to say you've left Microsoft. You know, so like, hey, you know, what have you what have you done with your life? I left Microsoft. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it technically was an internal transfer moving from um, LinkedIn to Microsoft. So I had tenure of over seven years there, and uh, yeah, I took a chance, and it just wasn't a good fit for me. But uh, good company, of course, and um, you know, good team, and and uh, no uh, no uh, no issues. It was uh, uh, just. Take, I'm actually taking a break, which actually timed out perfectly because uh, you know now we're all locked up. And um, I was what do you mean? What do you mean on, we're locked up? What, what do you mean? What, what are you referring to? <laughs> I, I was planning it. on I was planning on using this time to uh, work on uh, the follow up to uh, my last book, but um, you know our nanny is self isolating, and so I have a uh, uh, an 18 month old and a five year old. A homeschooling too. I'm in charge of homeschooling. Well, my wife's in charge of homeschooling, but uh, I'm trying. Your resume, you can say, you know. Uh, lead uh, learning uh, management systems uh, integrator. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anybody to recall, remember this this issue of me uh, homeschooling my daughter because if it doesn't work out, I don't want to be held responsible. <laughs> Child services calling in. I mean, this is being recorded. She's she's in the middle of like she's just starting to read, and it's like it's like it's a lot. It's really tough, you know. Phonics. I mean, I don't remember any of this stuff, but. Uh, you know, for a kid trying to read for the first time, she's trying to ride a bike for the first time. She's trying all these things, all this pressure. She's trying to fit in. I mean, I can't even imagine what that's like. Uh, uh, you know, at that age, five years old, trying to uh, trying to deal with all the pressure and uh, still have fun and and be yourself and and just come into your own personality. You know, I mean, I just I, I she's a strong little girl, and I got one um, you know coming up on her heels there to uh, have to go through this all again at the right young age of. 40 something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Really, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so, so grateful to have you on. 
we, we've had a couple of these shows already. The first one was really just me and Elad just wanted to kind of talk shit about, you know, what's going on from our perspectives as marketers during this uh, very interesting time to, to be a marketer when things are changing really quickly. Um, you know, one day to the next, things look very, very differently. And everybody's kind of just trying to figure out how they should be adapting. So we thought it would just be interesting to just get on the air and, and just kind of chat and share our ideas. And then um, I thought it would be really, really cool to have you on, uh, specifically with your background, both as a B2B marketer, but also just, you know, as a content marketer and, and, and kind of a brand builder. Uh, and I guess, you know, one of the questions I think everybody's kind of struggling with right now is what does it mean right now to build a brand during this crisis? Like how, how should brands adjust their, you know, their storytelling? How, how do they, how can you integrate your storytelling into the crisis? Um, or, or should you even? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. And I was thinking a lot about this lately, um, just from the, the, the couple of, of private Facebook groups I'm in is sort of like an open kimono where we just kind of, uh, uh, you know, bounce ideas off uh, of each other. And I'm seeing some folks who are, you know, losing a lot of money and then losing their, uh, getting, you know, um, uh, losing their, their jobs. And uh, I see others, you know, there's opportunities. So I, I, I think everything's changed, but nothing's changed in this case to where I would say with, um, you know, with content marketing for me, it's always been, don't, uh, don't, don't oversell, don't over push, be helpful, be uh, relevant, you know, be uh, educational. And uh, I think you see, you know, I was talking to somebody about this the other day as well. Like all everybody, all these brands say they want to take a risk. Well, it's certainly not the time to take a risk, I would say, but um, you know, the, the brands that do take risks, uh, I always ask myself, why, why do we end up talking about the same brands over and over again? So it's, it's, you look at Nike, you look at Ikea, uh, these are two brands who are pretty much the only people I think who've done a, a campaign, uh, a campaign, if you will, around coronavirus and, and something meaningful and something that resonated, something worked out well. The Nike, you know, uh, here's your chance to play for millions, play at home, stay in home, stay in, stay safe, stay at home. The, uh, the right. Ikea, the importance of home. So I think as a content market, I think it's the same as it ever was. It's if you have something to say, then say it. If it's relevant, if it's helpful. Uh, then put it out there. But if it's not, you know, don't pump out random acts of content. Don't pump out uh, mediocre content. Uh, I, I think if anything, it's an opportunity for us all to just take a break and slow down. Um, sure. I mean, I see a lot of budgets being cut. I see a lot of advertising being paused. I'm not, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I'm saying that, you know, we, we need to slow down as marketers, especially content marketers. We, we don't need to put out more content certainly we need more relevant content and we need to be more helpful as brands and i think that the biggest opportunity for us is to maybe step back and focus on our brand take a look at what does a brand mean for what do we stand for what do we not stand for uh and how do we fit into this crazy time do we have uh, is there something you can contribute is there's something helpful your brand can contribute to the conversation if not then maybe you should just take a break you know hmm. That's interesting. Um, especially, I mean, here in like B2B world, uh, B2B tech world, we're, we're kind of in the middle of this uh, interesting time where a lot of the solutions, I mean, especially like software as a service, they, there are solutions that are kind of relevant to the time. Uh, if you're, you know, if you can provide remote learning solutions, if you have a, you know, if you have some sort of software as a service that allows people to co collaborate, you know, from anywhere in the world, this is kind of your, your moment, right? Yeah. But, um, what do you, what do you think about that? Do you think like people should kind of like brands should, should address that head on and say, Hey, you know, you're stuck at home. You might as well, you know, use our software or, or do you think it should be more subtle? I think, I think you need to look at, you know, I don't think you need to beat around the bush as much as I think you just need to see what are the questions? What are the challenges? I mean, with a quick, uh, you know, a little bit of search on, on Uber suggest, or even, uh, one of the keyword research tools from Bing or, or Google, you can see what questions are being typed into the search engines, right? Uh, right? You can see what are the conversations that are being, or the questions, the queries that are being typed into the search engines that people need help with. And then how can you sort of map your strategy back to that in a, in a helpful way without saying, oh, we have the solution. Um, you know, I, I just think you need to figure out a way to weave yourself in there as a helpful brand uh, without, um, you know, without becoming too over salesy. There was, a, <laughs> there was an article I was reading this morning in Marketing Week, and I guess, um, I guess it's a fine line you have to go between like Nike and Ikea being really helpful with their messaging 
and inspiring. You, know, you can leave it, to, leave it to Nike with the inspirational message. Let's everyone else just try to stay, stay on point and be relevant and helpful. Um, Brewdog, who I love. Brewdog, I think it's an amazing story. Uh, I, I love that. Made, I love their beer. One of my favorite beers at uh, all the cool clubs here in London. You know, they, uh, <clears throat> they, they started making hand sanitizer, and they got a bit of a backlash because they apparently they, brand, they over-branded the fact that they were trying to help. And it's like, <laughs> kind of I'm, not overdid. Sure I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that, but it, you know, uh, if BrewDog's doing something cool and you know the backstory, then you know that that's not what they're like. That's not their culture, right? So uh, maybe you just had a marketer who was a little bit too ambitious, but they had the right message. They just, uh, it, was, it was perceived by some as being overbranding. But then on the flip side of that, you know, wh where's, the, where's the line? And uh, I mean, I think as we move forward and, and, you know, then I was at a conference a few weeks ago or a few months ago and uh, John O. Alderson, brilliant marketer, said something really interesting. He said, the next big war for marketers will be in um, data structure. Hmm. And, and what that meant to me was you either, you know, put your data uh, in the cloud <clears throat> in, in either a Google cloud or a Microsoft Azure cloud or whatever, but you structure the, your data the way that, that uh, the, the big players want it to be um, you know, structured so they, they can, you, you, you can get the benefits from their software and their, uh, their AI technology, <clears throat> but you're also playing their game. And the other side, if you don't want to play their game and you don't want to put your, all your data and your structure, your data in, in, in those clouds specifically, and, and you know, either uh, pledge allegiance to Microsoft or Google or Amazon, whatever it may be, then you have to work on building a brand because <laughs> it's either pay or play or build a brand. Right. And then the other part of that becomes, you know, even in search, what is 93% of all uh, online experiences begin with search. And there's studies that show even, you know, even on page one, a trusted or recognized brand will, will get like two or three times more clicks than someone untrusted, even if it's the top. Right. Result. So I think it says something about, you know, we spent all this time talking about data and big data and, and numbers and insights and data scientists and all that. And it seems that branding took sort of a back seat. And now it's, uh, I call it 2020, 20 into the next year is like branding strikes back. Everyone needs to focus on what their brand means, how it's relevant, what it stands for, what it doesn't stand for. It's like a punk rock band, like The Clash, you know, Joe Strummer. Joe Strummer knew exactly who he was, who he was fighting for, who he was representing. He was anti uh, big major label, even though he was on a major label, but he fought to keep his prices down, delivered a double album for 10 bucks. Um, you know, he, he had a message. They knew what they were. They knew what they stood for. And I think it's, it's something that everyone could take away from this at this time is just to look at who's leading the charge, um, borrow some of their you know, uh, their tactics and strategies for inspiration and sort of uh, put your own spin on it and push that forward and, and see what it means for you. But the biggest thing is there's no question what, uh, what type of content you should be creating because the data is all out there and this, the questions are being typed in to search and they're, you can figure that out pretty quickly. Um, and then you just need to figure out a way to walk into the room and be helpful and <clears throat> non-salesy and, um, you know, add a little bit of personality. I think that's always going to go a long way as well. You know, it's interesting that um, I think the other thing that kind of brands might be a little bit um, a little bit challenged to take a big risk is they want everything to be perfect, and I think uh, that's going away quickly as well. But look at you look at TikTok. TikTok yeah. is a platform that allows you it celebrates imperfection, where Instagram is all these perfect influencers, you know, with staged photos. TikTok is the exact opposite. And there's, there's, no, there's no question why that's booming, because I think we're all tired of perfection. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity for brands to experiment with TikTok and, and experiment with just letting their guard down. As, as Brian Fanzo would say, a friend of mine, you know, push the damn button, stop hesitating, take a risk, a small risk, um, and, and try to uh, <laughs> do something meaningful. Yeah, I think that's especially interesting right now. We're we're all kind of we're all at home, right? I mean, we we all have screaming kids in the background. Well, some of us do, uh, and we all have uh, you know we all have messy bedrooms, and we all you know we're all dealing. We're we're, real, we're literally all in the same shit right now, and I think it, it's kind of there's no better time to really you know be able to empathize with your customer than now. Like literally, everybody's going through the same thing at the same time all over the planet. Um, so I, I think that's also like a really big opportunity to kind of just seize on that. doesn't mean you necessarily need to say, hey, you're working from home. 
you know, here's how you can do that better with our software. But, but it means, you know, if you know that your customers are working from home, if you know that they're dealing with, you know, the stresses and the headaches and, and the anxiety of, you know, a global pandemic, then I think you, you can be a little bit more empathetic with them in your, in your messaging and be able to sort of reach out and say, hey, you know, we can't, you know, we don't have a cure, but, you know, maybe we can help you with this problem that you have. Yeah. yeah, I mean, exactly. Right now, I think you kind of nailed it, but comms, any way you can communicate more effectively, you know, with either your peers, your customers, your friends, whatever. Uh, I mean, it's hot right now. But, you know, the other thing is interesting is Zoom. I mean, obviously, we're using Zoom. Uh, I, you know, I knew who Zoom was. Uh, I've used it several times in the past. It wasn't my go-to platform, per se. But, uh, you know, I don't really hear Zoom talking about Zoom. I hear everyone else talking about Zoom. So yeah. uh, maybe it's it, maybe it's there's a case study there in sort of uh, uh, dissecting or re reverse engineering how they became the go-to instead of you know go-to. Where's go-to webinar? Where's uh, where's Google Hangouts? Where's uh, I mean Microsoft Teams is sort of in the conversation. Some cool stuff happening there. But why Zoom? I wonder. I wonder. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But catch I, I think what, what's interesting is I've also seen you know suddenly my my parents are on Zoom and. Suddenly, you know, the my uh, you know the kids are, are doing the online learning through Zoom, and I was like, Where, "When did that happen?" You know, it was just for meetings. It was just you know, it was just with uh, you know, uh, like tech companies. But all of a sudden, everybody's <laughs> using it. It's kind of interesting. Um, I know, didn't get I didn't get an email that said uh, you yeah. know anything from Zoom, even though I'm sure I'm in their database. But I got an email from uh, the London sock company. Mm -hmm. About uh, their new their new line of socks. <laughs> I don't know, I'll count on that. Yeah, forward, me, forward me that email, please. <laughs> I, I got an email from Canva talking about uh, stopping stopping the spread with their new templates. I guess it's somewhat relevant. Um, yeah, I'm just getting like John Barbados, who I love, having thirty percent off that. I'll, I'll, that's relevant all the time. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's just I'm looking at these emails and I'm like, you can see the desperation in marketers trying to take advantage of this, and it's not. You know, it's not a it's not a race to the top. Or it's not a race to be first. It's a race to, it's not even a race at all. It's it's just who who can be the most helpful and relevant. And um, there was another uh, there's an article in Marketing Week that was out last week. I guess um, I was looking at this. I was gonna hopefully oh here it is from Kantar Media. I think this is UK only, but you know, kind of it could be extrapolated to to Europe. But uh, just eight percent of consumers think brands should stop advertising. So. The, no one's saying stop advertising. Uh, they're just saying, look, do it differently. And, and, and the stats they found were 78% of consumers believing brands should help them in their daily lives. 75% saying brands should inform people of what they're doing uh, to mm -hmm. help the situation. And 74% think uh, companies should not exploit the situation. So mm -hmm. again, it's a fine line. 50% uh, think brands should talk as they have always. Uh, and another 50% well, another think that um, they should talk about their own brand in a carefree and light way. Uh, 41% think brands should avoid humorous tones, all kinds of interesting stuff in here. And again, they cite Ikea, Nike. <laughs> like It's the same brands over and over again, but everybody wants to be a storyteller and take a risk, but yeah. no one seems to be willing to take the plunge. Yeah, I, I, I like, I get a lot of inspiration watching TV commercials. I, I love TV commercials, uh, even when they're crap. I, I always like to, you know, try to figure out what it is they're trying to tell me and what, what's the main message here and how much do they pay for it and, you know, who they get to be the presenter and all that stuff. And I'm kind of curious about what you're seeing in, in the UK. Here in Israel, uh, like 100%, 100% of the TV commercials are, you know, time, time rel like relevant to what's going on right now. And it's either like, there's a lot of commercials for um, cleaning stuff, which happens around Passover anyway, but they're really pushing that. And then there are the brands that have really turned around, you know, like, like great commercials really really quickly so there's one from the lottery here uh and they have this series of commercials that they've been doing for for a while now where it's kind of like you'll, you'll see a group of guys and then one of the guys is kind of like splurging on himself and everybody's like looking like and then it's like brought to you by the lottery like you don't you know you don't know who uh who won it might be somebody you already know <laughs> and so they, they did one for uh corona where uh they're, they're all on a zoom chat and there's this one guy and he's like, uh, hold on, I have to sneeze. And he's like taking out a lot of toilet paper. And everybody's like, what? <laughs> and then he's putting like a lot of hand sanitizer. And it's like, you know, the lottery. So I, I think, you know, that, that's great. Like if you can kind of incorporate, uh, you know, what's going on and like everybody gets what you're talking about without having to say it, 
I think that's great. You're kind of in on the joke. Um, so, I mean, I think if you can, you know, beyond, obviously you can empathize, but if you can go beyond empathy and, and kind of just kind of laugh at all the stuff that we're, we're all dealing with, you know, having the kids run in into the Zoom conversations, uh, having, you know, the wife scream at you while you're trying to have a conversation with your boss, um, having, you know, you're, you're just about to close that deal on, uh, on Zoom and, and, you know, suddenly your internet gets crappy because everybody's internet is crappy right now. I, I think these are all things that you can kind of, if you can incorporate that somehow into your, into your marketing uh, and can really show empathy um, to what people are actually dealing with and not just say, you know, you know, you have this problem now, we can solve it. I think, I think that's the kind of marketing that's really going to be stellar right now. Um, I, I keep thinking, by the way, I, I, I never really forget that, that talk that you gave, uh, in last time, it wasn't last time you said it, but the, the time before we were talking about, you know, the, um, the big rock that you did yeah. LinkedIn, and you know, how that kind of really was content that was really, really evergreen for a long time. How, how do you think, like, does, is that kind of on the, on the tape? Like, do you put that to the side right now? Like. If you're if you've been working you know for for two months on your big rock and suddenly you know corona hits do you kind of put that to the side and then start working on on new stuff or or do you keep on you know developing that that evergreen content what are your thoughts on that yeah so it's interesting and and um yeah that's still relevant today the big rock and and the idea is the big rock is sort of your stake in the ground piece of content right at linkedin the the famous one was the sophisticated markers guide which was the number one right most downloaded lead gen piece of content for six years, right? Five and a half years in a row. Um, and we just revised it every single year. But you have to think of it like, like um, just to set it up really quick, you have to think of it like these authors, right? They'll write a book and then they'll go on tour for a year. And that's how right. you have to think about, that's your big rock, that's your stake in the ground. That's your, your, uh, your helpful, relevant piece that sort of solidifies who you are, what you're doing, and, and you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a story, if you will. Um, now, while you're working on the, on the big rock, which takes a substantial time to, uh, uh, to, to put together, usually a couple months, uh, the blog is cer certainly where you can kind of pivot and have that agile piece. So even though you have this editorial calendar built out, hopefully you have an editorial calendar built out for a month or two, um, you, know, you can slide all that stuff and push all those articles back and start writing in real time. So the blog was always uh, the mechanism for real-time marketing, uh, sort of agile to, to kind of pivot. Uh, and the big rock was always the stake in the ground, sort of the lead gen, sort of the authority builder over time through search and uh, social. Um, but the blog, I, I think the blog is, the, is still the most powerful piece of, um, uh, this, the most powerful marketing arm or marketing, marketing lever that any marketer has. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're big or small, whatever. One, one substantial blog posts written in a, uh, a very meaningful, relevant way um, could get you the top, could, could, could break you through at any point. And I think, uh, I think, I just, I, I'm just astonished how many brands and especially in B2B still focus, don't focus on the blog and focus on eBooks and, and white papers that are just boring and technical and uh, on PDF formats and stuff. It, it, it's the, the blog, it, it, to, to be, be honest with you, from a demand gen point of view, whatever, the only thing you really need right now moving forward is the blog and video. That's it. If you, if you, can, if you can master those two channels, you don't need anything else, so. Well, and LinkedIn, of course. <laughs> uh, I didn't talk about the uh, distribution arm there. I'm just talking about it from a content standpoint, uh, the blog and video, that's all you need. Nice. Um... Maybe, I mean, I know you have to jump off in like exactly five minutes. So maybe open up to questions. Uh, if anybody if anybody has any questions, I know uh, Michal from Social Bakers uh, has a question. We're seeing the same thing. We get more traffic than ever during this time and it's coming from our blog. Mantas, who's here with us, pushed this effort and they paid off big time. So does anybody have any, any questions for Jason while we have him here? Yeah, that's interesting though. Like at that research that uh, the Cantar did, you know, the, Consumers and 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 I'm assuming that bleeds over to prospects and buyers as well. People, people in general, want to know what you're doing as a brand uh, in this space. How you're taking care of your employees? How you're taking care of the yeah. product? How you're contributing? So, uh, a message from your CEO. It's not a. That's not some corporate bullshit. You know, speak. Uh, that's a real, like, honest and and you know. Don't get me on the the word uh, authenticity because I think that's thrown around so loosely and and. 
how can you really um, get your leaders in your company to write something that uh, maybe there's a mistake in it? Maybe it wasn't proofed a hundred times by the PR team. Maybe it was just written by the, <laughs> maybe they wrote it themselves for Christ's sake. But I think it's just the biggest thing of, of uh, how do you just be real, you know? Yeah. Um, so that people yeah, can see through I think the that's, talk. I, I think that's the biggest thing is, I mean, we're all, we're all people, right? You know, like there's this kind of artificial, um, structure that said okay you know you have these big companies and you have these smaller companies and you have the bosses and you have the workers and it's like you know we're all people we're all in this together we're all hoarding toilet paper we're all uh you know stocking up on hand sanitizer hand sanitizer and we're also trying to get through this you know we're all worried about our parents we're all you know going nuts from from our kids and and we're all just you know we're all worried uh to some degree or another about the future and i think it's a great opportunity to really uh to really communicate your 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 humanity uh through your marketing um but i i think another thing i i've been thinking about in, in at least for b2b brands is that you know i think what in a time of a crisis you know the the the, the ground kind of shifts uh and what was normal yesterday isn't normal and i think what b2b brands have an opportunity to do is provide you know kind of the the view from from up above. So if you're you know if you're a marketing technology company and you deal with you know you have a lot of data when it comes to let's say searches or or you know what people are doing on marketing, people are doing in terms of advertising spend, you can share that with your you know with your audience. Like here's what we're seeing. You know here's yeah. what here's what your competitors are doing. Here's what your community is doing. And uh, I know that Gong is doing that. Gong does a really great job. Um, of you know taking conversations and turning that into data and saying you know the the words COVID nineteen and, and Corona have, have you know shown up in forty percent of sales calls in the last three weeks and they can kind of show the graph which kind of looks like the Corona graphs <laughs> uh, so I mean I, I think that's a really great way people can be uh, valuable of value uh, right now to their audiences. Do you hear you hear Jackson back there crying? Can you hear that? No, no. Little, little, little Jackson, my little 18 month old, is wailing away. He's just, I think he's I, I thought I was hearing mine, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the last thing I'll say really quick, and, and I do have to run. I got a couple minutes, but uh, yeah, it, it, it doesn't even necessarily have to be like a blog post either. Like, I, I'm sure you see this all the time, Gabriel's on, on LinkedIn, just yeah. like, like three sentences, just a yeah. thought. What's on your mind, especially yeah. from your senior leaders? A text based post on LinkedIn that's not selling, that's just a, a thought or a helpful. So, oh, this happened to me today or, you know, whatever. Um, it's something, it's just a small little thought. It doesn't have to be a blog post necessarily, uh, but how do you put that? It just get something out there. Get something, um, some conversation going. I think if you look at uh, a lot of the LinkedIn leaders right now, I mean, obviously it's their platform. They know how to use it better than almost anyone. Uh, I think if you see the leaders, they're communicating on what they're doing and how they're helping. And uh, it's just simple, um, you know, 300 word sort of updates. I think you can do 1600 characters in a post. 300 word updates, like a Seth Godin sort of uh, statement or blog post, you know? Yeah, yeah, I love um, those. So it doesn't always have to be this big, massive thing. But then again, don't say something just to put something out there. Right. Yeah. Man, thank see, you so much. I see a question about sales here. That's it's interesting because I work, you know, I work very closely with sales at both LinkedIn and Marketo and, um, and uh, Microsoft. And it's interesting because you need to figure out a way for sales just to, to step back for a second and be helpful and relevant. Are they providing the essentials information in a no kind of BS format? So I think it's more important than ever for uh, marketers to be aligned with the sales team saying, here are the stories, here, here are the stories from our customers, here are the data points from the insights team, and how do you put that into the shortest uh, uh, condensed email of everything you need to know and just say, here it is, I'm here for questions and walk away, you know, and, and that's, that's how you do it. But you have to, sales have to keep their relationships and marketing needs to step up and, and get those stories and turn those into uh, uh, something that's helpful and relevant in, in the shortest format possible. And that is my call. I'm waiting for, I got to jump, but uh, thanks everyone. Connect with me on Listen, LinkedIn. Thank you me so much. You. Thanks All right. For joining. Cheers. Take care. And th thanks everybody uh, for joining. Uh, and sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, Thank you guys so much uh, for, for joining us today. Uh, for those of you in, in Israel, we won't be uh, running a show next week for Passover. So happy Passover. Uh, you know, keep it, keep it safe, keep it healthy, be happy, and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Ciao.